let's, uh, let's, let's go. Hey, just so you know, there was a, we, there's a, a, just some issues over with scanning services and they're really behind and we're trying to get the quizzes out and uh, so we'll, we'll make it happen. I already went through the quizzes and picked out, picked out a few of the questions where I, you know, like a lot of you chose a particular answer, which to me is an indication that it, was, it wasn't a good question or it wasn't a good answer. But I, want the, I want the ideal in all of the questions that the, is that the, the correct answer is like, like 90% of you get it right, it, at least 85%. So um, anyway, so we're, we're running through that. We'll probably release the scores in a little bit tomorrow. Um, okay, so J, JD is back. Uh, we want to say a couple things about global, and then we're going to have a conversation with somebody online. So, dude, what do they need to know right here? All right, so right here, we are in the third block of our uh, dialogue sessions. So next week will be the last um, week that we will have for that, which means we're going to be halfway through the semester in our dialogues. And right now, our numbers are sitting around 248 of you all have attended one of these dialogues, and that's about 31%. So... We're, I, f I feel like that's a little low, um, so when you come back from break or next week, if you sign up for a dialogue, hi, we'll be, just go back to your seat, we'll call you down. So if you sign up for a dialogue next week or any time after spring break, please make sure that you're there. There's seats that sometimes don't get filled, and that's like going to push us uh, to having to fill or have more seats at the end of the semester, and we may not be able to fit everything during our, um, you know, our makeup week that we have. Yeah, yeah, and if you're a person who's missed globals, um, you're not going to be allowed to do a global. So, like, you're, we're going to, if we run out of seats, you're the one who's not going to get a seat. So, don't, don't miss it. Don't come if you're really sick, reschedule, but don't miss it, man. We, don't, we just don't have seats. It's too difficult. Yeah. So, also, Mar hey, can I, list, can I have this moment? March 16th is Monday after we get back from spring break. Mondays, for whatever reason, you all don't sign up for globals. That's a problem for us. It's going to be a problem for some of you because, in, and it's just, it's on you, right? We're offering the, the seats that we need to offer. So if you don't get in and schedule it and show up, that's, that's your problem. And if you don't do a global, you're not going to be able to get an A in here. So you got to just get in and schedule a global. And Monday morning of spring, after spring break, we're going to have a bunch of seats. Just fill them. If they're empty, that's... Every empty seat means someone who's not getting an A, as far as I look at it. So don't have empty seats. You've got to do it. That's the nature of the game. So I just wanted to say, um, so far this semester with the Globals, those who have attended, thank you for coming. You've got, you know, brought awesome energy. Um, just in comparison from the uh, globals that I've worked with over the past three years being part of Woven Conversation, this semester I'm noticing that not only are you all more engaged, but we're getting better responses from our partners as well and just saying how wonderful it is and like how we've you know, come so far from what you know, our globals used to be like. So keep bringing that energy. Um, we will continue to provide snacks and coffee and everything in the morning to make sure that you guys are you know, nourished and have some sort of energy in your body outside of the sleep that you just got. So, you know, keep coming, keep rocking it. I really appreciate everybody that showed up to one. You're making this semester by far the best that I've had in World of Conversation. Hey, also, also, let me just say, I talked to Bassem. He's our Iraq coordinator. He's in Iraq. You'll meet Bassem. He, the, the conversations we just had with Iraq, um, he said they were amazing because you all were talking about what I talked about in class about with regarding Iraq and the war and so on. And the students in Iraq were really thankful that the participants in those dialogues knew something. And so, um, yeah, just on behalf of them, let me just say thanks because it, it, it matters to people. Um, okay, uh, so that's the thon number. Congrats. See you all. She's coming in here. So uh, I want to say something about about. I'm not going to. You know, I know that a number of you dance. I'm not going to like have you stand or something. And the reason I'm not is because thon, it, it, these kinds of things. A lot of times, you know, it's like 
one person gets the credit or a small group of people get the credit for something that is a massive undertaking. No, this is, this is about so many thousands of students who came together on this. And, and what I want to do is, because I know that some of you aren't all, you're not Thon addicts or you're not, you think like Thon's okay, but well, some of you are snarky about Thon, I'm sure you are. Because, you know, you know, this, you know, people are snarky about everything, right? It doesn't matter what it is. So people are snarky about puppy dogs. I don't know how you could be, but I'm sure some of you are. But I, I just want to say something. Um, first off, the United States is recognized, for better or for worse, as one of the countries in the world where more people do volunteer work than... than uh, do, we're a country at the very high end of people, the amount of time that people give toward volunteer activities. I guess that's how I could say it. Now, part of the reason for that might be because our tax base is so low and that people, private citizens have to step in and do things that governments and many other countries take care of. But it also says something about the spirit, I think, about pieces of this culture in this country that it's actually pretty cool. And... What we know about volunteering, which many of you do in many, many different ways, what we know about volunteering is the best predictor of a person's willingness to give their free time to other people without remuneration. The best predictor of that is previous, is previous volunteering. Meaning that the more you volunteer, the more you volunteer. And so what THON does is it gives lots of people opportunities to put their toe in the water of volunteerism. And when you put your toe in the water, you kind of see what it is and you experience the collegiality that goes along with all the teams that are put together. This lofty goal which really which matters and um, and see the good things that can happen when people open their hearts and move forward and do do things for other people without expecting anything in return and so what Thon does this amount of money is actually I always I like to say this it's actually kind of small in comparison it's not the most important piece of Thon even though people will think that it is. The most important piece of THON is all the volunteerism that THON volunteers will be doing throughout their lives, largely because they participated in something like THON. And again, it's not just THON. There are lots of other ways in which people at Penn State volunteer. This is just the one that receives the greatest amount of publicity because it's the biggest. It's pretty, it's pretty huge. So the way in which Thon, the positive feedback is all of the future stuff that people will do that they wouldn't do, except that they had this experience here at Penn State, and then they take that experience with them in the world, and that's just really cool. So kudos to that. Um, all right. So I want to introduce you to somebody today. And speaking of volunteering, um, this is Mari Luz. You're going to meet her. Um, Mari Luz is, I met, I met her in 2013, I think. I went to Brazil, I was invited to go down to Brazil and give a talk. And there was this woman there who this young woman who was going to give a talk. And I, kind of, I met her the night before, and I, she, was, you know, I, I, she didn't speak any English, and I don't speak Portuguese, so they, you know, I, can, I can understand a few things, but mostly not very much. But she spoke no English. I spoke no, virtually no Portuguese. And um, so we just kind of kept crossing paths, right? And that's us after she talked, so... Um, but this is her on stage. And 
Later, the organizers of the event told me the story that they invited her to come speak because of the work that she's doing and where she lives in, in the favela Complexo du Alemón. How do you do? Okay? Complexo du Alemón? Okay. And she works with kids. And this place where she lives is really poor and really violent. It literally means the German complex, and it was started by this Portuguese guy, or this Polish guy, years and years ago. But she just just work for the kids. But that's not what, what the organizers told me was they couldn't get her to tell her story in some kind of coherent way. Because it's really hard. You know, when you do a talk like a TED Talk, you like, man, you got to be really structured. You got to know where you're going. You got to be right on point, and you have a certain amount of time, and you got to make it happen. And they couldn't do that with her. And they finally just said, listen, just go up on stage and talk. And we'll just deal with it. And so she did. And she started talking and she started telling her story. And, and I will tell you, just as Mr. Rashidi is the nicest, who you met, is the nicest human being I've ever met in all of my life, I've never met a human being who went through the kinds of trials and tribulations that Mariluz went through. She told her story, and at every two minutes, there was a, in my mind, like, oh my God. Just when I thought, just when I thought the next thing couldn't possibly happen, then she described another part of her childhood, her young adulthood, her et cetera, et cetera. And it was, oh my God. By the end of her talk, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, my, my own included. So intense. So afterwards, we had lunch together, and that was us after lunch, okay? Um, and here's where she lives. It's a neighborhood, and it's known for these um, sky cars, these cable cars. And... You know, from up above, it looks like kind of a cool place. Um, and from down below, it's a really, really tough, violent place where the police will often just come in and kill with impunity. Just kill, just murder people. You know, the, the gang members and so on. And the gang members are only there because they're tr trying to build and create a community. And she says, you know what? Um, this is where I live. And after everything I've been through in my life, I'm going to do something for the kids because I don't want the kids to have to go through what I went through. And so she put together this favela, this art project. She calls it favela art. And they've got this style of painting and she teaches kids to paint. And they sell their paintings and She's a community center, and the kids come together at the community center, and it's really awesome. And I've been a part of her life for seven years now, so I'm always getting videos and photographs and so on, and, you know, I, I fundraise for her. And this is this kind of style that she does, right? And they paint all over the community, kids, because the community is just like bullet holes and, like, it's crazy. But we're going to put some nice paintings together. We're going to make it look nice. So here's a, a young, a uh, little bit older woman who's painting. That's me. That's a painting that I commissioned for her and the kids to make for me. That's me in my living room. It's one meter by two meters. It's really cool. Um, these are some of the kids painting. Here's some of the kids. There's smocks. It's just awesome. And so what I thought was, Marie Luz said, hey, we just got this community center and things are really, really bad in Brazil. And she's amazing at doing what she does. And she doesn't have an education, so she's just amazing. Like you meet her and you're like, holy shit. Um, and I said, well, I'm going to introduce you to my class. So we're going to bring Mariluz on the screen, and we need a couple people. And 
Mariana. Mariana is going to translate. Hey, can you stand up? I want to introduce. Can you come? Who's, who else is coming up, bro? Margaret. Margaret, if you could come on up. Are you here? Margaret? Yeah. Okay. Margaret, because you're co- Margaret's coming up because she was a star in one of our global dialogues. She was amazing. Am I right? Yeah, she killed it. Yeah. So you can you can sit here. Hey, wait! But before we do, just introduce yourself to the class. Yeah. Um, I'm Kayla. I'm a first year student here at Penn State. Cool. Awesome. Margaret. Hi, I'm Margaret. Um, I am a freshman. Awesome. Have a seat. You're going to meet Mari Luz. And, and can you just say where you're from? And... Yeah. My name is Mariana. I'm a senior, and my family's from Brazil. So I'm going to tr- help translate the conversation today. And where are they from in Brazil? They're from Sao Paulo. Uh-huh. All right. So do you want to hop up on the screen? <laughs> hola. Hola, Mari Luz. Que tal? Okay, Mariana is going to translate. Can you just say that? Wait, why don't you come down here first and just look into the, just look into here so they see you're going to be up in the. Oi, de novo, Marilu, so Mariana. Look right in here. Yeah, look right in here. Vocês conseguem ouvir a gente bem? Sim, e você consegue ouvir a gente também aqui? Estamos ouvindo perfeitamente. Está ouvindo, Luan? Legal. A gente, vocês vocês querem falar assim, não precisa as crianças ouvirem ou você quer testar os avós? Sim, o vídeo seria melhor. Então, a gente tem alguns estudantes aqui que têm algumas perguntas para vocês. E eu vou perguntar ao Sam agora o que ele quer fazer. Tá ok. Okay, awesome. Yeah, awesome. So you can walk up there. If you can hear better up there. I can. Yeah, yeah, okay, go. So what questions do you, what question would you ask for Mari Luz? Anything at all. You're just like, boom, you're in the middle of a dialogue. Bro, help me out here. What would you ask of her? You just heard me introduce her really quickly. What do you got? Can we get like a shortened version of your backstory or is that like too much? Mariluz, ela quer saber se você pode explicar um pouquinho sobre você e sua história e por que você começou esse projeto. Tá, é, eu sou Mariluz Maria, Só um provavelmente a senhora já me apresentou. Aguardar? Vai dar, se você pode pode dar uma história bem curta, só de um minuto. Já posso, já posso falar? Pode, começar, por favor. O Sam já deve ter me apresentado para vocês, hoje eu tenho 38 anos, eu tive um, alguns problemas é, familiares e um problema emocional que me fez perder a memória okay. e wait, tive wait, muita dificuldade em... Só, só um minutinho, Mariluz, eu vou traduzir agora. Ok, translate. So guys, Mariluz is 38, she says uh, she's here with the kids today, but some of her backstory is that she had a bit of a rough family history, some of... Um, her mom, she said, suffered from like a kind of Alzheimer's that made her uh, prematurely lose some memory. That's how far I got right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, Mariluz, uh, se você pode continuar, por favor. Eu tive um problema emocional na perda de duas meninas gêmeas que no vídeo do TED eu acabei não falando que elas morreram e isso me causou uma perda de memória é, total e aí eu tive que aprender tudo de novo. E já tinha dificuldade de estudar E na tentativa de conseguir aprender tudo de novo, eu percebi que muitas pessoas também precisavam aprender. Tá, tá bom, you so, so uh, okay. okay, so she said that um, this trauma in her family uh, was really hard for her, and uh, at a similar time, she also lost two women in her life that were very important to her, so she also ended up suffering from some premature memory loss, Um, and so she had to learn a lot of things from scratch, and she always had trouble in school, academically, um, so that was even more of a challenge for her. Uh, uh, Desculpa, Marilus. Sim. Pois aqui onde eu moro tem mais de 450 mil habitantes, e nós só temos uma escola de ensino médio para crianças desse tamanho. Uhum. Então, nós tivemos essa dificuldade em conseguir é, colocar todas as crianças na escola. Foi daí que eu comecei o projeto Favela Arte. Entendi, só um minutinho. 
So she said in the community that, the community that she lives in now, this favela, they're usually very poor neighborhoods. Um, there are so many kids and so many people willing to learn, but they only have one school. So they've created a middle school for children about um, these boys' age. So um, right now that's where she is with favela art. So these are the kids that are learning how to paint and make art. In okay, we have a question. Ok, então Mariluz, uh, uma menina aqui tem uma pergunta para você. Deixa eu escutá-la primeiro. Can look right here. Um, what do the kids need? What do they? Sorry, what do they meet? Yeah. Who do they meet? What do they need? Oh, yeah, what do they yeah, yeah. need? Ok. Um, Mariluz, então ela quer saber o que as crianças precisam nessa escola e para fazer esses projetos de arte. Sim, é, aquelas escolas elas têm extrema dificuldade em conseguir lecionar, pois dentro de cada. Oh, lost her. Go ahead. What did she say? Uh, she stopped in the middle of a sentence, so I didn't understand it fully. Hang on. It's amazing we're connected at all, actually, to be honest. Vocês estão ouvindo novamente? Uh, é que, tem, é que tem pessoas me ligando. Então, você, e, pode repetir, é... você pode repetir o que eles precisam? Ó, Obrigada. Na escola para crianças, a partir de sete anos, tem 40, 40 alunos por turma. E nessas turmas não tem material, pois quando o ano começa, o ano letivo começa em fevereiro. Uhum. E aqui o governo, ele dá o material mas ele só dá em depois das férias de julho. Entendi. Então, o material só chega para as crianças depois das outras férias. Entendi. Então, deixa eu falar aqui. So, she said the... So, seasons are kind of opposite in Brazil. So, right now it's winter, further it's summer. So, she said term usually begins in February, um, but there's so many kids per this one school. There's about 40 kids in each class. So, when school starts, the government helps provide and sub subsidize some of these materials, but when they have a short break in July, what would be their winter break, um, they've run out. So they don't have enough of a, like a stable like fluctuation of, of school materials. So they, they run out and not everybody gets what they need. Hey, we have a question. Tá bom, mais uma pergunta aqui. What's your question? What do the kids do when they're not in school? Sure. Ela quer saber o que as crianças fazem quando eles não são na escola. O que eles fazem de divertimento. Eu não entendo. Só para repetir a pergunta, que eu estava com fome só e o outro estava com lua. É, pode repetir a pergunta? Sim. Ela quer saber o que as crianças fazem uh, fora da escola, quando eles têm o tempo livre. O que eles gostam de fazer. É, aqui se estuda quatro horas por dia na escola. Depois que eles saem da escola, na maioria das vezes, eles precisam ser atendidos por projetos sociais. Só que a gente não dá conta de todas as crianças. Uhum. Eu atendo mais de mil crianças por mês. Nossa. E outros projetos também. Só que eles fazem... É, esses aqui fazem futebol. É, Existia um outro projeto aqui chamado Nave do Conhecimento, mas está fechada. Uhum. E o curso de inglês funcionava nesse local que está fechado, que é a Nave do Conhecimento, porque lá a gente tinha estrutura para poder fazer o curso. Legal. Okay. Deixa eu traduzir aqui. So she said outside of school, school lasts four hours a day in the morning, and then they're also required to learn some English outside of school. That's also been difficult, she says, because of, again, how many people, how many kids need to learn. There's not enough fluent English teachers in the area, but they, the school encourages the kids to um, find social projects to do outside uh, of the classroom. So that can um, involve just playing football and learning how to play properly and um, that kind of team but, spirit and everything. But this is not a school like it, people here are used to going no. to. That, no. Like y'all, when she says school, y'all, right, and the kids are in school, that's not a school that any of you went to, okay? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about a school with very few materials and maybe not desks and maybe not chairs or maybe just chairs and no desks and, like, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we have a question from down front. Okay. Mais uma pergunta aqui. What's your question? Mariana? Uh, uh, just one minute. Sim. 
é, uma, um, é um dado importante. Um dado importante é que aqui a gente ainda tem dificuldade de colocar as crianças na escola. Então, os projetos que atendem as crianças. De, na área da fazendinha, onde fica o projeto, de cada 10 crianças, 6 estão fora da escola ainda. Porque não tem vaga. Então, os projetos é que tem que atender. Entendi. Uh, so, she said just now, um, it's hard to keep kids in school as well. So, um, with every 10 kids, there's usually a couple missing. Um, and I don't mean in terms of, like, legally missing, just they're at home or they're doing something else or their parents can't uh, walk them or take them to school. There's sometimes not enough space for all of them to come in at once. So, she said that's also something important to note. Um, okay, question. So, you want me to move? Yeah, name, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, the kids that you're with, what are their names? As crianças, os meninos que você tem ali, qual são os nomes dele? Espera aí que eles vão responder. Eles estão perguntando o nome de vocês. My name is Mua. My name is Mua. My name is... My name is Luca. Luca? My name is... My name is... Duarte. Duarte. Legal, obrigada. Oi. Luan, Lucas e Eduardo. Eduardo, ok, eu perdi. Obrigada, legal. Ask him. Do the boys have any questions for our students here? Like what uh, life in America is like? Ela quer saber se uh, os meninos ali têm algumas perguntas para a aula aqui. Se eles têm alguma curiosidade? Sim, deixa eu perguntar aí. She's gonna então, ask. eles lá estão na aula coletiva com o professor. E eles estão falando sobre a gente. Ela acha que é sobre escola, essas coisas todas com a I, I wish you all paid attention like that kid in the front. Yeah. Desculpa, não entendi. Você pode repetir? Gostaria de saber como a aula de vocês funciona aí. Como a aula funciona? A aula funciona. Hum. O tempo de aula e como que são as aulas aí. Vocês ficam muito tempo escrevendo se a prova é de múltipla escolha. Essa Porque aula a gente tem específica que... ou as aulas aqui na Toda universidade? Aula. As aulas Nessa... normais. Para criança, de, criança e adolescente, adulto. Sim, sim, sim. So, um, he wants to know the logistics of the classroom right now. When we start, do we take notes? Are we listening a lot? Um, I, wait, I can answer that. No, no, they're not listening. No, they don't take notes. Some are probably watching porn, right? I won't tell them that. Um, they have no idea what else are going on, but... Uh, então essa aula que a gente está yeah, agora... Não, não vou colocar a aula que a gente está agora é sociologia e nessa aula especificamente não temos muitos uh, não tem não precisa escrever muito não precisa é. sabe só precisa chegar na hora na hora que aqui começa às três da tarde e é uma hora e meia então a gente acaba tá, com três e uhum. meia. a gente acaba quatro e meia e é só discutir uh, problemas sociais problemas globais e geralmente nós temos uma uma pessoa do outro lado do mundo como você para explicar como como as coisas são nessa parte do mundo Ok, listen. Uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna make the final statement. Desculpa. Did that? So tell her to ask the boy in the front. What's his name again? Eduardo. Eduardo. Mm -hmm. Tell her to ask Eduardo. Um, 
if he's a good student. O Sam quer saber se o menininho na frente, Eduardo, eu acho, se ele é um estudante bom, bonzinho. Peraí, é, o Sam quer saber se o da frente é o Eduardo? Sim, se é ele é um estudante bom. Se ele é um estudante bom? Sim, quer saber. Tell, tell então, him to... aqui nós temos três meninos que não faltam aula. Eles se comportam bem em sala, a nota deles é sempre acima de nove. Não tem reclamação, a mãe nunca é chamada na escola por causa de briga e essas coisas. Eles são de uma... a família deles, as crianças são muito bem comportadas. Até porque a educação que eles tiveram, é, tradicional, de família, foi, foi uma Sim. coisa mais família. Eles têm mãe, pai, avó e tia. Desculpa, Outras crianças Ma Desculpa não Marilisa. Tem. Só temos um pouquinho mais de tempo, mas eu vou traduzir aqui. Uh, so, ah. Eduardo is a really good student. He's usually a little quiet, but he always comes to class when he can. Um, the grade system, like here we have zero to 100 percent. There they just have zero to 10, not in percentage, but she said he always gets above a nine. So she's really proud of him. Awesome. All right. Hey, so, okay, so listen, um, in the oldest boy, um, what's his name again? The one in the very back. Yeah, in the back. I think it was, it started with an uh, Desculpa, você pode, qual o nome do menino bem atrás de você? Esse. Sim. Esse aqui é o Luan. Mulano. Não, é outro. Luan. 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 Yeah. Isso. Ok. Tell him you wanted to see his smile. <laughs> ele quer um sorriso. Não, ele está na minha frente, eu estou sentada, mas eles são maiores que eu. Ele quer um sorriso fora do Luan. Oi? O que ela disse? O que ela disse? She said, well, this one never smiles, so let's see what we can do. <laughs> okay. All right, listen. Tell Mariluz that I said thank you for visiting the class. Mm -hmm. Mariluz, yeah. a gente, todo mundo aqui quer, fazer, quer falar muito obrigada para o seu say, tempo, para o tempo do, dos meninos, see. e oh. deixar a gente falar um pouquinho com você. Então, muito, muito obrigada para hoje. Ah, nós te agradecemos. Muito obrigada. Como é que fala, meninos? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So say, yeah. Obrigada. So we say, obrigada. Like, thank you. Obrigada. Obrigado. 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 Prazer, meninos. Yeah, Muito obrigado. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. See you, Mariluz. Gracias, gracias. Obrigado. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Did. Thanks, man. It was awesome. Thanks. Hey, I am. Um, hey, th hey, you killed it, by the way. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. You know, um, can you, though, can you just say something about the vi like, what you know of this favela? I mean, you, yeah. your parents don't allow you to go there. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Even get close to it? We don't really go close to favelas. So there's a lot of favelas in Brazil which just kind of roughly translates to just like a really poor, low-income community. Um, I think the biggest one in Brazil is in Rio de Janeiro. So very often favelas are kind of the most basic materials put together to form some sort of shelter. It's not a house or apartment. It's just kind of <clears throat> walls and a roof, if you can get it. So it's usually made of like rusting metal, kind of... Um, you know, like different materials, like a tin roof or something like that. So favelas are also uh, meant to be kind of pushed away from all of the common public resources that you need. Um, so they're on the mountainside, which means they're really sloped. So there's, it's like a hilly terrain. So the farther up you live in the favelas, the more you're walking. And that means the higher you are elevated and the more you are removed from society in that sense. Um, so favelas kind of originated from so like I said, they're really poor, um, but like the drug, violent, drug and violence, I mean, that originated in the favelas just came from lack of government subsidies and resources mm -hmm. that reach the favelas. In so, including like running water, Right, plumbing. exactly. So um, yeah. like clean running water, stable electricity, 
Um, heat, those are privileges to those who live in favelas, so that also means it's really hard to, um, you know, have your family live there if you have kids, if you have anyone that you need to provide for. So those that live there don't have the luxury of depending on those things very constantly. So it kind of naturally gives a rise to a way to find other ways of income or making money, which is sometimes selling drugs or getting involved in a gang. And um, the gang violence is really, really prevalent, especially in the favelas, um, because that's their own kind of government, their own kind of structure. And the gangs usually look out for the people in favelas, but that's not always 100% how it works. Um, so, so yeah, so um, favelas are visually kind of kept away from, you know, like towns and cities. Um, the people that live there usually are not very proud to live there, but, yeah. you know, they do have, everyone has pride in what they do and what they've survived. Yeah, yeah everybody has pride, man. Just like, and so you have people like Marie Luz who are just, um, just amazing to, to what she does for how she gives of her time and her life. Um, and the key is, uh, the, I started doing kind of just raising money for her because I, you know, like I meet people around the world. I mean, I raise money for lots of people and lots of projects in around the world, people I meet, but she's the one who's like really just on man. I mean, she's in my will for crying out loud. Um, but Hey, I gotta, I gotta, we gotta raise, we gotta get some books for her, like, because the kids, she need, the kid, we need to get going for the kids right now, so she just communicated with me, like, can you just help out, we gotta get workbooks, and we need things for kids to do, um, can you help, so that's my Venmo, and if y'all can just, if y'all want to pitch in a little bit, a, a buck here, a buck there, it's all good, man, I, I'm gonna be pitching in, so whatever you give, I'll double it. Yeah, can I just and, say the exchange rate right now in Brazil is very extreme. One dollar is 4.6 reais, which is their currency. So anything you give really means a lot to them. Yeah, it's cool, man. It goes directly it's directly to the kids. So if you want to Venmo a little bit, awesome, man. I'll add it all up, and I'll tell you what we raised, and I'll, I'll double it, and I'll send it down tomorrow. So, um, yeah. Okay. Um, Hey, thanks. You rocked it. I really appreciate it. Yeah, that's not easy to do, by the way. Hey, so um, I want to talk about a couple of things while we're talking about Brazil. What I what I realize and recognize is that, you know, when you think about the history of the world, mo a lot of us, we just don't understand how the world got to be the way it is, right? Remember, I did like the ladder of upward mobility and how, you know, some people are at the bottom, some people are at the top, and but how'd they get there, right? How'd that happen? How does it happen like that? Like, what happened in the world? And so, when I, I have this, I just want to say a few things about con what I call conquest and advancement. And look at, here's a photo that I took in Haiti. This is a river going through Haiti, Port-au-Prince. Per capita income is $450. That means if you add up the GDP and the divide, basically, essentially, all the income in Haiti and divide by, um, not the GDP, but income in Haiti, divide by the number of people, that's, that's the average income in Haiti a year, $450 a year. And it's not that Haiti is so inexpensive because a beer, even at a wholesale beer place, it's going to cost you about 70 cents. And that's my mark for how much things cost, right? A, 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 you know, a, a half a kilo of rice is going to be about 60 cents. So that doesn't get you very far in Haiti. So just look at this river. Got it? And look at this one. How how is that? How is that? Right? How how do you go how does one country have this? And another country has this. And that's per capita income in Switzerland. How do you do that? It's not, it's not, it's not the bio, it's not the DNA. It's not the genetics of the people. There's something else happening, right? There's, it's a complex array of factors and forces. It's not just because, okay, Haitians are black and 
the Swiss are white. It's like, nah, that doesn't do it. It's something, it's more complex than that. What happens? Hey, wait, can I, can you, can you turn the volume on the stream down for just one second until I say, no, they got it in the back, right? You guys, turn the volume on the stream down. Hey, listen, I don't want to say this on the stream. Y'all, like, I can't, I, I can't give you anything when I hear noise. Like, I can't. You, you have to understand, like, I'm trying to really put my thoughts together and give you something that you walk away from this class going today at 420, you walk out the door and you say, well, I never thought about that before. I can't do that. When I'm stopping every 30 seconds or I'm distracted or something, I can't. I can't think. And so you, we, got, we have a half hour left. I'll, I'll actually give you some things that would be useful, I think would be useful, because I actually studied, this is what I did all of my original work on, is the, are these questions. So I've been studying it for almost 40 years. I, can, I have something I could say. I can get it down to a half hour and say something that if I were in your shoes or when I was in your shoes, I had a lot of questions about this stuff. So I know what the questions are. So do me a favor and just stay. Just give me a half hour. Okay? All right, man. You can turn the stream up now. So Listen. This is one of the great questions of life. How is one country this poor? Think about, in, in every, you see what that looks like? It smells exactly how it looks. It's not about Haitians. You know, Haitians are like people, Mari, the people who are Mariluz's neighbors in the favela. They're, 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 they're people with pride. And people who, it's maybe their home. I've walked in people's homes where there's nothing but a dirt floor and a stool. And I walk in people's homes, they have pride. And they're like, listen, you, you sit in the stool. And then, you know, wiping the stool off to make sure it's not, doesn't have any dirt on it. And like the pride, this is my house. Welcome to my house. And the house might be, you know, not any bigger than like, I don't know, like a third of this. Maybe like that. But it's okay, because it's their house. And, and I think, yeah, people have pride, man. So the people living in these houses, these are houses, my friends, right? These are houses. And people might be living there, living right on this dump where you can't even imagine the smell. You just can't even imagine. And like, But it's like, they got pride. This is it. They got pride. People live there. And, the, the, and what they're doing is they're going through and finding things that they can sell. Because that's their job. That's how they make money. And these people here, they have pride also. And they were born into a different situation. So for them, it's just a little bit different. They're not better. They're not smarter. Haitians are pretty amazing, y'all, right? I can go. I can go to a street that, that is pretty much, you look at the street and you're like, oh my God. And I can take my cell phone and I can... Give my cell phone to a kid, maybe like this kid, or maybe like the kid, who, the, the, the boy at Wardo who was on Mariluz's lap. And I could give my cell phone to them and say, hey, can you fix my cell phone? And the kid will pull out these tools and like, I'm like, not Apple tools, like just tools. It's an old screwdriver and a knife and so, and like pop my cell phone open and like fix it. And I'm like, the dude's eight years old. I'm like, how did you figure that out? Like, how did you do that? What are you doing? How did you make that happen? Some people are dumb. People are amazing. And they're entrepreneurial. And most of us in here wouldn't survive a day in that situation. And that's brilliance in my mind. Living in the favela where Mari Luce lives. What she's able to do. So how, and most of us wouldn't survive here either. And most of them wouldn't survive here. Because it's a different world. But it's not better than or worse than. And so how did that happen? Like, how does it happen? And here's the best of my understanding of things that, that I could possibly get to you to get to, to have some kind of a vision. And I don't know if I can. It go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you back to the choice and chance 
issue. You got to study history for it. You got to study history. Most of us don't study history. We're not interested in history. And so we look at things like these photos and we're just like, okay, I get it. What, whatever, whatever it is, I'm going to, I'm going to just deal with it. I just will never a- answer those questions. I just won't answer them. But then we live our lives making assumptions about how the world got to be the way it is. How are we here? How is, how are we here? How are we here in the United States? It's like you can just say, well, because, I don't know, I guess we're better because we did this or we did that. No, no, no. There are actual reasons that, that, this, that this building is like this. And, and, and it's not in Haiti. There is not a single room like this in all of Haiti. I know the entire country. There's not a room at all like this anywhere in the entire country. It's like, how is that? How is that? And so the best way I can tell you, this is, I'm going to give you the history of the ontological history of the world. And it goes from there. And when, it, when you go from here, it's just like everything you do and everything you think about, even now and into the future, you got to just go like, okay, how is this? So here, give me like, I just need a, okay, do, can I, can, I just need a, cu- a couple of volunteers. Hey, why don't we use you again? Can, bro, no, not you. Uh, dude, can we use you? Can you volunteer? Uh, I'll, I'll show you. Man. Bro, can you volunteer? And, and then I need, I don't, how about you? Do you want to volunteer? Yeah. Okay, so imagine this. So you guys, are, you ever hear the, the game King of the Mountain? You know King of the Mountain, right? You, you know how this, you know how you play? Did you, you guys, you ever play King of the Mountain? Any of you? Yeah, women don't play this. Did you guys play King of the, you must have played. Did you play? Yeah. Well, can you, hang on. King of the Hill. Yeah. Dude, how do you play? Um, so we would play like on a dock, like in like in a river, and the I, like the object of the game is to like whoever's on the dock would like at the end of the game would win. So like everyone would try to climb the dock, and we would wrestle and try to knock the other one off into the river, and then it would just be repeated. And, and so you got to start. So you start right. with everyone has more or less an equal chance to get on top of the dock. Right. And then whoever gets there, you go. Right. OK, so here. So it's like this. We're going to play king of, the, king of the desk right here. So you all stand up. And what we're going to do is at some point in time, we're all going to fight to be on top of here. OK. And so, yeah, dude, you're already halfway there, my friend. <laughs> all you got to do is just take a little step up and you're on. So. But we're going to work on that. So listen, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk around this thing. It's like musical chairs. You ever play musical chairs? Right? Because we're going to walk around this thing. And at some point in time, a bell's going to ring and we're going to scramble to get on top. Okay? Yeah, you, yeah we're going to jump on top. And we're going to knock each other off to make sure that we're, we want to win. We want to be on top. You want to be the first one. Because it's king. You want to be king. And the king is the one that gets on there first. Right? You got it? So now some of us. Okay, so check this out. So we're all, we kind of know what the game is here, right? Everyone know? And so what, what's going on in your minds? Like some of you are, some of us are strategizing already. Some of us are like, yep, okay, how am I going to do that? How am I going to put my foot to get up there first? Who, how am I going to, how am I going to throw a bow, an elbow at her, knock her out of the way, knock him out of the way while I'm putting my foot up there and I'm already on, right? I'm thinking about it, right? She's, what's your name? Olivia is thinking about it, right? And so, but some of us, maybe you're not. Maybe you're just like, yeah, I get the King of the Mountain game, but I don't feel like doing it. I'm not interested. So, okay, so got it? Choice, chance. Choice, chance. She's making a choice. She's going like, yeah, I don't really want to play this game. Um, and he, so we keep going. And, and bro, what's your name? Brian. Brian. And so Brian might be saying, yeah, um, no, I'm not going to scramble to get up first. I'm just busy in my own. I'm not even making a choice. Brian's just sort of in his own world. Even though he knows what's going to go on, he's not smart enough in thinking like, hey, he's not going to do it, right? Me, I'm thinking about it and I'm strategizing, and, but I got, I got this dude here I got to contend with, man. Bro, what's your name again? Santa. What? Santa. Santa. 
Satchel. So we got Satchel here. And Satchel, I'm like, oh, damn, this is about me and Satchel now. And like, but maybe in the end, Satchel's going to be stronger than me just because by chance, y'all, by chance, not because he ate his spinach, just by chance, he happens to be bigger than me, right? And so when it comes time to scramble to the top, let's say I either, we either use our brains or we get light or something happens. But watch, hang on. But let's say, there's this. There's this chair here. Okay, now keep going. So now brains come in. We're like, oh, hang on. It's not just about strength. It's not just whether Olivia is stronger than Sam or Satchel or Brian. or Right? But there's a chair. And here's the deal. If, you're by, if you happen to be by where this chair is, oh, man. Like, that chair is your ticket to get on top. That chair is just like, you're on. Here, you can't... There's no, there's nothing to, you, there's no foothold here. So when the bell rings, if you happen to be here on the front and you, you can't get a foothold to get on top, you're not going to make it. But if you, the chair is there, you're like right here, you're on. And so if you get lucky and you happen to be, when that bell rings, if you're the one standing right next to the chair and your foot's going, you're going to get on top first because you got lucky. Or, you're going to be really smart and you're going to be strategizing to get to the chair. So I'm going, we're going around the circle. Watch this. And I'm going like really fast. We keep going and as quickly as possible, I get next to the chair and then I slow it down because I don't know where the bell's going to be. And I'm like, hang on, I want to be by this chair as much time as possible. And I'm like, oh shit. Okay. Brian, he, he doesn't, it's Brian, right? He doesn't even notice the chair. Because, so he's just not intellectual, he's not ready to be on top. He's not ready to be king. He's not even smart enough to see there's a chair there. Olivia kind of sees it, but she doesn't really know what it's for, but she has an idea that, ah, maybe, okay? And then the bell rings, and one of us is on top. So let's just say it's me for a second, right? Boom, I'm on top. And so I'm the king. And, okay, maybe partly I'm top, I'm on top, because I was aware of the game that was being played here. So I'm like, oh, Sam, he's got, maybe, maybe it's only because I'm aware. I was smarter than everybody else. Maybe I'm on top because I happen to be standing right next to the chair when the bell went off. And like, oh, I just got up. Maybe I'm on top because true to, well, it may not seem that way. I'm actually stronger and bigger than Satchel. So like I was able to knock him out of the way, but any number of things, choice, chance, but now I'm on top. The first person here, you got it? Now, what's that mean? What's it mean with King of the Mountain, my friend, when you're playing on the dock? First person gets on top. Um, who has the advantage? Uh, who has the advantage? Uh, I'd say you're at the weakest point, actually, because then we're all like, you're like the target at this point, so we're all trying to like knock you off of the mountain. And... I got you, I'm the target. Right. But who has the advantage? <clears throat> Oh, you have the advantage. You have the height. You have the. I got the height. I got. I can. I can use my leverage against you all. I can see you coming at me, because you're not all in one team. You're all separate teams. You're all like separate people, separate ethnicities, separate cultures, separate nations, separate everything. So I have the advantage. I see you coming at me, and not only that, but I can be like, dude. I can pull my armies together because I'm going to have my armies or whatever it is, and I'm going to be like, satchel you're not allowed to get any closer than 10 feet, so you need to move back. Because he's, he's dangerous, so you got to move back 10 feet, my friend. I'll call my armies out a little bit more, right? Got it? Okay, good. Right there. Now, I take, I've taken care of him. I use my power because I'm here, y'all. I'm king. You got it? I got up here. I'm king. I make the rules now. I'm making decisions about how the rest of you are going to be. Dude, don't touch the table, my friend. Back off just a little bit, and you're okay right there. I start to decide who gets to come up here. I decide what the rules are going to be, and I decide how we're going to move forward. I happen to be the first one that got, I got here, the first one. You see that? You see, it's, if you don't study history, you don't know who the first people were in particular positions of power and how they either kept it or how they lost it or how they used it to ensure that they stayed powerful. And so... For example, if I go back to Haiti and I say, oh, you want to know how Haiti's poor? You want to know how Haiti's poor? You can't look at Haiti today. You got to go back two, three, and four hundred years and look at Haiti. You will never understand Haiti today. You want to know why Switzerland is so rich? 
You don't look at Switzerland today. You got to go back two, three, four, eight hundred, two thousand years and see what the people in that region were doing to lead them to be rich now. You want to know why the U.S. is rich right now? You don't look right now. You don't look around and say, well, we're great because we're this multicultural society. And look at this. We have people from all over the world. And like, we're really connected. We speak different languages. And like, yeah, okay, we, we have slavery and we have genocide and we have those stains on our history. But we're actually really an amazing people and we're hardworking and we have the best democratic system in the world. And that's why we're rich and wealthy. And that's why we're kings of the world until the frost and his people come and take over. Okay? Got it? So, king of the hill. Chance and choice. It's all part of it. And so, okay, man, hang on. Thanks. Thanks, dog. Thanks, man. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thanks. You guys, you can sit down for a second. So here. When I think about Brazil, and I think about Latin America, and I think about these people. So this is the wall. Remember, remember these folks? The caravans of migrants coming to the United States from Guatemala, from Honduras, from Venezuela, from El Salvador, from these poor countries. What Donald Trump referred to as the shithole countries. Okay? And he only said what lots of other people think. It's not unique to Donald Trump. Where are they coming from and why are they coming here? What's driving them here? What makes them want to come here? Like, you've got to ask that question, right? Why are people trying to get here? Why are we building a wall? What is it? Why do they want to come? Like, is they just want to come because they want to make more money and they want to take it home? Or like, what else is there? What else is driving people? What happened in their history? Just like, what happened? Oh, dude. What happened in Haiti that leads to that? What happened in their history? Are you, is anybody curious? Like, are you really curious? Like, how do you get there? It's like, and so, just like, what happened here? In those beautiful cities. And then, so what happens to these people? What happened in their home countries that lead them to want to come here? So when I just sit back, and, you know, and I'm just kind of like, yeah, all right. Um, yeah, you, you got to build a wall because you got to keep them out. And there's not enough for everybody. And go home and go back where you came from and so on. That's just, okay, great. Okay, but that's not very smart. Like, that's not smart. Smart is like, you don't have to say, oh, we should take them in, oh, the, all these poor people, and they're fleeing oppression, and they're fleeing. That's not smart either. Because if they were coming, and if I said, decided, hey, well, actually, they're going to come, bro, and they're actually going to, we're going to build some houses in your backyard, and that's where they're going to stay. So all you liberals who think like, no, we shouldn't have a wall, and we should let anybody in who wants to come, and so on, really? How about if we build a housing development in your backyard then? How's that? And most of you would say, well, I'm not that liberal. Like, that's kind of cool, but it's cool in theory, but in practice, like, what do we do? Right? So the question to, I have is like, where are they coming from? How'd they get here? Right? And, and so when I, when I think about the history of Brazil, and I think about everything that is Latin America, right? And remember, right? So these are, this is the Indian blood, right? It's Asian blood, comes down through the Bering Strait and into the Americas. You can see that in Mari Luz. She has indigenous blood. Indigenous, it's simply a word that means originally of the land. So she's indigenous. You can see that in her features, right? And you can also see black features. So Latin America is made up of indigenous peoples and people of African ancestry. Most slaves brought over to the Americas during the slave trade did not come to the United States. Less than a half a million slaves were actually taken off boats in North America and brought into the United States. The United States was a reproducing slave population, but not in other parts. And so in, most, in all of Latin America, it was not a reproducing population, which is why it was disproportionately male slaves 
and didn't matter. You know, in, in Haiti, for example, the average life expectancy at the peak of slavery was about seven years, meaning it was more profitable to bring a human being from Africa, work them to death in a seven-year time, get your money back, and go buy another slave instead of trying to keep them alive. Don't work them so hard. And then try to keep them alive. It's actually more probable. Just work them into nothing. Work them into death. Seven years. And so throughout the Americas, so look at Brazil. So this is where Mariluz lives. Those are the bulk of slaves in the Brazil. So all those kids there were black. Their ancestors were slaves. You're like, what happened in Brazil? What happened? What happened all over Latin America that would lead Latin America to be so poor? In so many areas. Like, what happened? And what role does the United States play in that? Like, what do we play? And, and when I look around at this room and I think, is there a connection between the, the money at a place like Penn State University and then the poverty that we've seen historically in places like Latin America where we see people like this coming from? Is there a connection there? And if there is a connection, then what responsibility do we have? At least to learn about it. That's all, Right? Like, you know, you had a shirt on the other day that said, veterans before refugees or whatever, right? Okay, well, these are refugees. So then veterans before refugees, right? Like, well, okay, but well, what, who are the refugees, though, right? First off, veterans before refugees. You know that even today, even after Obama's increased pay, because, by the way, those of you who are conservative, Obama increased pay for people in the military more than Bush by the way, but even with that, like 25% of enlisted personnel in the army are qualified for food stamps. It's like, what are we talking about here? Like, so veterans? How about people in the military also, not just veterans, but how about people in the military and then find out? So, but who are the refugees and why? Right. And so, when, you know, when I look at this and I think about, um, hang on, I think about this map and I think, wow, man, all the, the ways in which this region right here was the region of the United States. It was our land to do what we... Remember the, the, what I told you about it? I'm going to give you a 10-minute history. So hang on. Everybody, take a deep breath because I'm going to give you 10 minutes. You don't have to believe anything I'm about to say. I would prefer that you don't. I would prefer that you don't repeat it because if you repeat it, you would, if you don't repeat it in the next 24 hours, because you at least need a little bit of time to check up and see whether I'm a lunatic or maybe something that I'm saying has some basis of fact to it. This is my perspective. I'm not going to give you a completely one-sided perspective, but in 10 minutes, I'm going to tell you a side of the story that you probably don't know. And you also... You know, so I'm going to, I'm going to, now it's going to be nine and a half minutes because I'm going to, it's going to be nine minutes because I'm going to tell you something. So back in 1986, I was walking in the road in Nicaragua. Did I tell this story? And there was a war going on that was sponsored by the United States. And I passed this old woman in her house and the front of the house was blown off by a shell, by a tank shell. She later, I walked by and she said, hey, gringo, donde vas? Because there were no Americans at this time. And she said, where are you going, gringo? And I said, ah, I'm going down the road. And she said, ah, have a seat. So I sat down and we started speaking. And she told me the story of her house and what happened. And she was really old. And she said to me, listen, gringo, after we talked for a while, and we're speaking in Spanish now, she says, when you go back, you're a teacher, right? So when you go back, I, I, do me, make, uh, make a promise to me that you'll always talk to your students about what you've seen here. And I said, okay, I, I will do that. And I made a promise to her, and I've never broken that promise. So when you, so now we have eight minutes left. 
So give me eight minutes. So get off your phones. Wake up. Give me eight minutes. So you don't know this unless you study it. But by and large, the region that is Mexico is part of North America, right? From Mexico on down, by and large, this is the land that was claimed by the United States in what's called the Monroe Doctrine. All of this land, it was first claimed by the Pope in the Treaty of Tordesillas, which is why the Pope drew a line here. And he gave all of this land to Portugal and he gave everything else to Spain, including up here. But the French and the British came in and they battled it out. And in the end, everybody speaks Spanish here except one little area here. And these folks speak Portuguese because they were given by the Pope to the country of Portugal. But by the time we get to the 19th century, the United States controlled everything. And we set up systems in power. And this became just land for us. And all the governments were the governments that we, by and large, controlled. And we gave them the resources they needed, and we gave them the weapons they needed, whatever they needed, to ensure that they would stay in power. Why? Because we set up trading networks between all of this amazingly fertile land here and coming up into the Americas. And it's just like our playland. It's just like a key area of the economy for us. And so Latin America became this place that was just synonymous with Uncle Sam. And so companies went down and they just took over land and they paid off the rich, the elites, the oligarchs, right? They paid them off and they gave them whatever they needed to give them in order so the rich would then use their power to ensure that whatever the Americans needed, they would get whether it was land or mineral resources or whatever it is, or people, and then they would get it and they would have access to it. And so all the mines in the, I can't even begin. I can't, I don't have enough time. I can't even begin to go there. But essentially the amount of money that left here, the amount of resources left here, all here, and went up here, it's just incalculable. It's incalculable. And so much of our wealth, just like so much of our wealth is built from the blood and the sweat of slaves. Y'all have any idea how much this country owes a debt to slaves and the slave system, the Africans. You don't just get rich in the way we got rich without some degree of labor that we got from slaves. You can't, the, the cost, I've seen the cost added up of how much slaves gave to this country. It's just you can't you can't even add the numbers. It's so, it never and then we oh I'll come maybe I'll come back to that. Same here. And we set up repressive systems and systems that absolutely stripped rights away from the people. And we they were the most unequal nations on earth for well over 150 years. Unequal, meaning about a tiny majority of people who mostly looked white and were white because you have Indians, you have Africans, and then you have all the owners, all the elites, and they were all the Europeans who have light skin. So wherever you go here, you find that the people in control historically have been white. It's shifting now. It's a little bit different. But all these folks... And then we just insured it. And like when I first started studying militarism in, in Latin America and reading about the things that the United States did in order to have access to all of these resources, that's the thing that turned me into a radical. For a while, I identified as a Marxist, a radical Marxist, because of what I read and what I studied. And, and what took, took me over the top was when I studied and read about all of the, the armies, the, the death squads, the militaristic squads, paramilitaries that we armed and trained and sent back into the countries to ensure that poor people would never rise up and make demands about what is theirs. So we have tin, farm, tin mines in Bolivia. Do we need the tin because it runs our economy? Well, when the miners in Bolivia decide that they're going to rise up because they're being completely exploited. Completely exploited. Then, we, then the military goes in and shuts them down. 
And that's all paid for by the United States. And the amount of people that were killed is just, in, again, incalculable. To kill by weapons, paid for by us. This was the one that took me over to These were four nuns who were beaten, raped, and murdered in El Salvador by a squadron of soldiers who were trained at the United States. And they just went back, and they were beaten, raped, and murdered, and we knew about it. We knew who did it. We knew who, did, who called it out. We knew who made it happen. That was, there were people who were working closely with the United States. This is one. I don't, I mean, you couldn't have time to go with hundreds of thousands of cases, the millions of people who died, right? But this was, this was the one that turned me. This is one that when, this is the moment I became a Marxist Leninist. It started hating the United States. But I was young, you know, I was 25 years old. But I started hating the United States. I don't hate the United States. I'm not a Marxist Leninist now. But these were, these were four American women. Nuns. We did, we did nothing about it. Nothing. We did it. We did that. Right? It's part of it. And so I started saying, oh, no, man. I just, it just changed me. It did something to me. And after that, I started hating this country a lot. I've since developed a bit of wisdom where I don't hate this country. It's not about that at all. In fact, I, now I work with militaries and stuff. It's a very different position. But I understand it, and it lives in me, and I see it, and I get it, and I can talk about it. And it's part of it, and part of making the world a better place and making this country better than it already is, because it's already a pretty cool country, by the way, the U.S. It's actually a really cool place. To make it better is understanding these kinds of things. So when I talk to Mariluz, this is what I see. This is the history of Brazil that I understand, and I know why that favela got to be how it is. And so that's why I do the work that I do with people like her. And that's why I want to bring you in on it so you can educate yourselves and rock on it, man. Like, it's all cool. It's good. Final comment. Monday morning. Yo, make sure those globals are filled on Monday, my friends, and don't miss them. We have limited seats. Have a safe weekend, yo. And don't, can you just not do anything stupid this weekend? It is State Patty's Day, right? God.